Well, good morning. Welcome to Cross Community Church. Welcome to those of you at our Pecola campus and those of you who are at home watching online. Uh, have you ever had one of these experiences? Um, you've been talking to someone uh, while they're driving down the road, and you're having your conversation, talking about whatever, and in mid-sentence, the call drops. And you think, did I say something? Did something happen? So you obviously you, you pick up the phone, you call them back, and they don't answer. Well, that's it's strange. I wonder what, what happened. And so maybe you pick up the phone and you call them again, like, hey, call dropped, wonder what happened, you know, need to know. And then your mind starts running these scenarios of, you know what, in the middle of that sentence, it did sound like it cut off in kind of a dramatic fashion. I wonder if maybe they had a wreck, like maybe somebody ran into them or they ran off in the ditch. Like, I wonder if they're okay. And suddenly your thoughts start to spiral out of control a bit. And you're, you're just like, okay, I know they're somewhere. Should I get in my vehicle and go and drive and make sure they're okay? And you've got all of these things going through your mind. And then the phone rings again. Oh, uh, hey man, sorry, I drove over Backbone Mountain and the call dropped. Uh, just, just wanted to pick up where we left off. And you've had all of this stuff going on in your mind, convincing yourself that something terrible has happened, when in reality it was absolutely nothing. Sometimes our minds do that to us. Sometimes when we become afraid or we worry, it amplifies something that turns out to be absolutely nothing. Today we're going to be talking about worry in particular. And worry is a thing that almost all of us deal with, uh, whether you do it way back somewhere in kind of the background or whether it comes out like the forefront of your life. Almost every one of us worry about Something. Now, worry can be what I described with regard to the, the phone call. It can be that overwhelming, heart racing, can't seem to catch your breath kind of thing. But it can also manifest itself in, a, in, in something like a dark cloud. The dull ache in your stomach, the inability to be fully present or to enjoy the moment because you, you're anticipating that something might happen. You're worried about a loved one. You're concerned about a situation. Something's going on, and rather than being able to be fully present in whatever situation you're in, you're worried about something else. Usually it's something in the future. Is the job going to work out? Is, is my friend or my loved one going to get better? And it kind of clouds uh, the rest of your life. Now, worry can be powerful in our lives. This week, I asked um, individuals to share. I posted on social media and, and asked individuals to share things that they were worried about. And some of you, thank you for uh, posting and, and writing in in public. Uh, also thankful to those of you who texted me in private because some things we all worry about are very, fairly easy to say, but sometimes things are really dear to our hearts. They're really close to us. They're not so open. But as I, I read through the responses, basically we, we boiled down the things that people worry about to one of, of three kind of classifications. Uh, the first thing uh, people responded they tend to worry about is the future. Am I going to get the job? Am I going to get the promotion? Will I get married? Am I going to have kids? Uh, what's what's going to happen with our nation? Like, what's going on with COVID? Are we ever going to get through this? Will things ever return to normal? How is the economy going to work out? We begin to worry about things in the future, things that are unknown to us. Are things going to be okay? The, the second class of things that people tend to worry about is their family. So this is, this is kids if you're a parent or maybe it's your spouse. Um, the, it's really centered around the health and safety of our loved ones. Got a, a young kid that's going to be driving soon maybe and you're worried like are they going to be safe or maybe your kid's going to school for the first time or, or, or just whatever the, the circumstances may be in their life. Are they going to get sick? Is something going to happen? And we worry about those things. I know many parents who sit up at night um, frustrated that they gave their kids such a late curfew because they just want their child to be home where they can stop worrying and know that everything is okay. So we worry about the future and we worry about family. And the third class is we worry about our finances. For some of us, it's a really present concern. How in the world am I going to pay off this debt? How am I going to make rent this month? Very present worries. And then others of us, it's you know, how am I going to send my kid to college? Am I ever going to be able to retire? We tend to find things to worry about, whether it be our future or our family or our friends or our finances. We tend to carry worry with us. 
You see, what happened when God created the world, made, you know, formed the earth, created the Garden of Eden, made Adam and Eve to live there in the garden, there was no such thing as worry. There was no fear. There was no insecurity. There was no worry whatsoever. Adam and Eve existed in a perfect relationship with God where they understood that because of their heavenly father, everything was going to be okay. They didn't have to worry about anything. But as you know, when sin entered in, men and women who were created in the image of God, the, that image of God in them was shattered by sin. And suddenly, insecurity, fear, lack of certainty kind of crept into our lives, and it's clouded the way that we view the world. I have a, a pretty good friend here in this church who told me about a family member of his. It was a family a couple, and they uh, were struggling with infertility, and they had for some time. And they'd gone through the treatments, and they'd done all the things, and kind of had come to the conclusion that they would likely never be able to have children. So they're driving down the road one day, and all of a sudden, the husband slams on the brakes. What emerges is a little two-year-old little boy wearing nothing but a diaper that had wandered out into the road in front of them. Of course, they look around for a parent like me who wasn't paying adequate attention. You know, the kid slept out, slipped, slipped out the door or whatever. Um, and as they continued to look and look, they didn't ever find a parent. As it turns out, when they called the police, this little boy was known, as were his siblings, and the family was known. Um, this is a family that didn't watch their kids very well. well. The couple, as they drove off on that day, they began to wonder, could this little boy be ours like, could we pursue this, this young boy? Maybe we, he, he could be the child that we want, and we could be the parents that he need. Um, so they began this really difficult process. There's, you can't get a lot of information in situations like that. Like, uh, DHS and other agencies can't just divulge, yeah, he has really terrible parents. You should pursue him. And so they, they went through this really lengthy process. They had to go through, like, home studies and all the things that you need to do in order to be able to adopt. And through a kind of a, a crazy set of circumstances, after a, a lengthy period of time, they were able to adopt this two-year-old boy that they almost hit, who they found wandering uh, in the middle of the street. And of course, they're, they're overjoyed, like, we get to love this child we've always wanted, like, we have this opportunity to be parents, we've always wanted to do this, and he gets to have a good family. It turns out that he had been abused and neglected fairly severely. Well, in, in the days and the months that followed that adoption, they begin to notice some unusual behavior in this young boy. He was a little over two at the time. And they, they noticed that um, as they would clean the house, and you know when you do the deep cleaning and you move the couch, you know, and vacuum under there too, they, they would notice that there would be food like stuffed away under the couch or in a drawer or hidden away. And over time they came to understand that this little boy had lived in such a state of neglect that even at two years old he learned to hoard food that he didn't know where his next meal might be coming from, and so he would hide it away in various places to make sure uh, that there would be food available. So the parents, they, you know, sit down the best that you can with a toddler and say, hey, it's safe here. Like, you don't have to worry about that. We're going to take care of you. We love you. We're here for you. And even though he was already living in a safe home with a, a deep freeze full of food and a pantry that was stocked, he was still doing some of the things uh, that, that he'd learned in his former life, learned with his former family that he thought were essential in order for him to survive. Can I tell you the same is true for us? That we have lived in a world apart from Jesus, a world that is broken, a world that is uncertain, a world that's outside of our control. And so uh, we, we do our best to accumulate things to make ourselves feel safe, and then we worry about what might be coming next. We don't have certainty. But can I just say this? For those of us who are believers in Jesus, he's like a good father. He's saying, hey, you don't, you don't need to worry about those things. That thing that's on your mind, that thing that's concerning you, that thing that you've been turning over and asking all those what-ifs about, you don't need to be worried about that. Instead, you can trust in your good Father. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 25. Jesus, in teaching us how to live as members of God's household while still here on this earth, 
He's teaching us uh, how, to, how to walk away from the fleshly patterns that we've known from our former lives, but instead how to live as children who have now been adopted by God and are now members of his household. And so he says it very flatly right here on the front end. He says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, at the very beginning of this, he, he uses this phrase, for this reason. And what he's telling us is that what comes after um, for this reason is connected to what he had just been saying. And what he goes on to tell us is that you don't need to be worried about your life. In, in this context, he says, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor as to your body as to what you will put on. In the, the time of Christ, in the first century, in the setting where Jesus would have been speaking these things, the vast majority of people lived at a subsistence level. That basically meant that every day they would get up and they would go out and hope to be hired. And they would go to work all day. They would be paid with a denarius. It literally just means a day's wages. They would take what they made that day. They would go buy the food that they could buy. They would eat and consume all that, maybe have a tiny bit left over, uh, but not very much at all. With no refrigeration, no bank account, that sort of thing, not a lot of excess, it was really common for people to wonder, am I going to get to work tomorrow? Like, am I, I going to be able to buy food? Is there going to be enough to drink? And then have closets full of clothes. You might have a couple of sets of clothes at most, and you would watch as those clothes would become threadbare, and you'd wonder, am I going to be able to get a couple extra days in here? Is there any way I'm going to be able to provide for, for my clothing or for my family? Is there going to be enough? Now, if, if you're here and you're in that shape today, we would love for you to call us. Like, we want to take care of that because we don't live in a world where that's, that's as common. Like, we could come together and we could feed several families. We could clothe several families just from our excess. But we do have worries, don't we? There are ways that we worry about our future, our family, or our friends, or maybe even our finances. And Jesus says very plainly, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. He concludes this verse with a question. He says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Isn't there more to life than eating and drinking? Isn't there more to life than just the clothing that you put on? For some in our world today, the answer is no. For some who have never come to hope in Jesus Christ, who have never come to trust in Him and have hope for eternity, this life is all that there is. Paul actually makes that very argument in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the resurrection and how he suffered for the gospel. He, he says this in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 32. He says, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? And then he asks this. He says, But if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross to be crucified, spend three days in the grave, and ultimately be raised from the dead, that we have a living Savior and a hope for eternity, let's eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we're going to die. If Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, if we don't have a greater hope of a greater reality in Him, really what we should spend our lives doing is eating the good food. You know what I mean? You've got to go and pursue it as if this life is all that there is. Might as well eat good food and enjoy good company. Pursue all the treasures and the pleasures that this world has to offer. I mean, go and get it. Like, pursue life. You only live once. You should go and enjoy what you can right now because this life is all that there is. I submit to you, if you want to have an understanding of what's going on in the world all around us, the, the, the pursuit of the treasures that we saw last week that Jesus warned against, where he said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because moth and rust just destroy those things. 
If you want to know why people are worried today, it's because they've lost sight of a greater hope. They've lost sight of who God is. Maybe they've never come to know the hope of the gospel. And they're just eating and drinking and striving to enjoy what little life they have left. But for us, those of us who have come to faith in Christ, Jesus would ask the question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is there not something greater going on here? Is there not more to this life? He goes on in verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow and they don't reap. They don't gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? You ever been like pheasant hunting, quail hunting, western Oklahoma where they're growing all the the crops and there are wheat fields? It's this really tragic thing that happens where you're looking for a specific type of bird which seems to be elusive because you're, you're hunting it and there are tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of these little tiny blackbirds everywhere. And it's like, come on, like, I want a pheasant. I don't want all of these other birds. But there's like just thousands at times they'll like almost darken the sky, like move like clouds, like huge masses of birds. Jesus is like, hey, those birds, they're not sowing and reaping and harvesting. They're storing up in barns. But God cares about them. He feeds them. And then he asks us a question, are you not worth more than those Are you not worth? Is your life not worth more than that? Has Jesus not demonstrated that you're worth way more than those birds? Jesus is making a statement of value here. Describing the kingdom of God, Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of God is like the shepherd who left the 99 behind to pursue the one sheep who wandered off into the wilderness, who was in danger. Jesus fought for you. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. He endured the beating and the mocking and the abuse and the pain and all of those things shout of his love for you and for me. They speak of his goodness toward us, that he would die on a cross, that we might live a life that's not consumed with eating and drinking and whether we're going to have enough clothes, but instead that we could move away from those worries and instead walk in the abundant life. That means a life that is fuller, a life that is greater, where we find satisfaction for our souls. Jesus says, you're you're worth more than the birds. You're worth more than that. Listen, if I died on the cross that you might have a new life, do you not think I'm going to feed you? I take care of the birds. I'm going to take care of you. I've demonstrated your worth by offering my life. My blood was shed for you. Jesus has chosen us and demonstrated how much he loves us, how good he is, his overwhelming goodness to a sinful world and sending his son to die that we might have life. And have it more abundantly. Last week, Jesus urged us not to waste our lives piling up treasures and possessions, which were fleeting. This week, he's urging us not to waste our life on worry, waiting to see if our what-ifs are going to work out. It's an invitation to trust him. Look what he says here in verse 27. He asks the question, who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? All those things you're worried about, the what-ifs of your life. Who of you, by worrying, can change any of those? And the answer is, none of us. We can't fix it. We can't change what the future holds. Who of you by worrying can add even a single hour to his life? He goes on and he speaks now about the the lilies of the field. Verse 28, he says, And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. 
Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? I mean, look at, look at the, the flowers of the field. Like, they're beautiful. Like, God has done that. And that's just going to be harvested and put into ovens, like, to bake bread and stuff. Like, if God does that for the grass, how much more will he care for you? Then he says these few words at the end of verse 30. He says, you of little faith. You see, worry takes up the space in our heart that's supposed to be filled with faith. We were made to trust and to depend fully upon our good Father. And worry says, I can't trust Him. That I've got to, I've got to solve this problem. I've got to be anxious over this problem. I've got to be thinking because I can't trust God. We, don't, we would never say that. It's like none of us are like, oh yeah, I think God's not for me. God's a bad person. But in worrying, we're saying, I can't trust God to take care of the thing that concerns me. But Jesus is going to speak to that. He's going to push us a little bit further. He says, so don't, don't worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles seek all of these things. Unbelievers seek all of those things. That's what they have. They believe this is the, the, what they're doing, what they're living here is all there is to life. But for us who believe we have an eternity in heaven with our heavenly Father who loves us. For those of us who would say God is sovereign over all. He spoke the world into existence. He created us on purpose. We are his workmanship created uh, for good works in Christ Jesus. For those of us who believe that Jesus died on the cross for us, the argument here is, is are you not worth more than birds and lilies like God is going to take care of you? So don't worry. Don't spend your life worrying like unbelievers do. And he says this, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Isn't it the uncertain and the unknown that drives us to worry? Have you ever worried about something and then it happened? What if they get into an accident? What if they get cancer? What if things don't work out in my world? What if, what if, what if? Have you ever worried about one of those things and then it happened? And you were at more peace going through the actual suffering than you were beforehand when you thought it might be coming but you simply didn't know? It's often the unknown and the uncertain that drive us to worry, like, what's going to happen? Like, I don't know what's going to come. What if things go bad? What if I spend my whole life and I never get to get married or have kids? Or what if, what if, what if? Well, here's the good news. God knows all of those things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. See, what's unknown to you is known to God. And it turns out that He's a really good Father. And in the same way that your kids in your household, they know. And they're going to have enough food. You're going to take care of them. They're going to have clothes to wear. And you're going to provide for them. God is, is urging us to trust in him in the same way and just to know that he understands. He knew our very problems before we ever brought them to him, before we even knew to worry about them. Our heavenly father was at work. See, the temptation of believers is to live like we did before we came to faith in Christ. To live like the little boy who was formerly in a home where there wasn't enough. Hoard up treasures and possessions for ourselves. Worry about what the future might hold. But the good news for us is that we've been adopted into the household of God, who is a good and gracious father, and who's going to take care of everything that concerns us. As a matter of fact, our God is so great. He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, and He's working all things for our good, even the things that we suffer. See, I'm not going to stand up here on the stage and tell you that everything you, you're worried about is going to work out the way that you want it to. But I can stand upon the Scriptures and tell you that everything in your life is going to work out for your good. That your Heavenly Father is for you, that He's working on your behalf. Sometimes... 
We get so focused on the struggles of this life, on our worries, that we lose sight of the bigness of our Savior. It's like worry and faith are in a wrestling match. Y'all ever have this, where you're trying to trust God, but things aren't going very well? And you're like, God, I, listen, uh, I, I want to trust you, and I'm, I'm praying for this thing, but I'm, I'm concerned, God. Would you, would you work in this situation? Can I tell you, that is the most normal thing. It ought to be happening in our lives. In Mark chapter 9, there's a story of a little boy. And since his very young days, this little boy uh, has been possessed with some sort of spirit. And it would throw him to the ground, and he would roll around, and he would foam with the mouse. He, he was unable to speak, like, his entire life. And I'm sure the parents, just like you and I would do, they, they wanted to see their child be healed. And so they'd probably gone to every doctor. They'd pursued every avenue, and yet the boy hadn't been healed. These parents had even come to the disciples of Jesus and said, Could you cast out this spirit? And they couldn't. There's this beautiful picture in Mark chapter 9 when they encounter Jesus. That father, I want you to think about this. This spirit would throw the young boy into a fire where he'd been burned, would throw the boy into the water where he'd nearly drowned. Can you imagine the worries if that were your child? Like every time you go out in public, like what's going to happen? Is he going to have another episode? Is the thing going to happen? They encounter Jesus and the father says, if you can, please take pity on us and help us. Jesus responds. He says, all things are possible to him who believes. In Mark chapter 9, verse 4, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe, but help my unbelief. God, I, I trust you. I know that you're a good father, but I've lived in this broken world long enough that things don't always work out. Like, I know that you're good. I know that you're loving. I know that you're gracious. God, I, I believe. Would you help my unbelief? I want to walk through this in faith, in full trust in you. I don't want to spend my life, waste my life on worry. Would you help my unbelief? Philippians 4, 6. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. And he does a really strange thing with, with his sentence, with, with his speaking. He says this. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know what he said three times in that sentence? Pray. Look, look back at it here. But in everything by prayer. So you should pray. And supplication. You know what supplication is? It's prayer. And he says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. You know what letting your request be made known to God is? That's prayer. In striving to be anxious for nothing. This is the same word in the Greek, by the way, that Jesus used for worry. We pray, and we pray, and we pray. We take our concerns to the one who already knows what's going to happen, and the only one who's actually in control. We pray and we trust in our good Father who can handle what's concerning us today. Can I say this to you? In the midst of worry, prayer is oftentimes more about surrender than it is about supplication. It's more about surrendering our wills to God's and saying, God, I don't know what's coming, but I'm going to trust you that whatever is coming is for our good. It's a part of your perfect plan. In the midst of worry, Prayer is more about surrender than it is about supplication, than it is about changing God's mind or changing the circumstances. We trust in God's perfect plan. And in prayer, we're wrestling with God until we're fully ready to trust. We remind ourselves that God has a plan. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's asked his disciples to pray for him, and they keep falling asleep. And he's been praying over and over such intense prayers. The scriptures tell us that he was sweating drops of blood. Do you remember what he prayed there? Because he was about to face some stuff. He was about to be beaten beyond recognition. He's going to be mocked and spat upon, rejected. Nails driven through his wrists and his ankles. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what was coming. Father... There be any other way. Let this cup pass from me. And you remember what he said? Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
not my will, but yours be done. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? You, may your kingdom come and your will be done. What we do when we, pray, when we pray is oftentimes surrendering our will to God's. God, I know how I want this to work out. I know how I think this situation should go, but I'm going to trust because you're a good father. Because I see how it went with Jesus. And because Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, like salvation was possible for the world, an extraordinary amount of suffering worked out for the good of the world. Can I say the same may be true in your life, that that thing that you're going through is not in vain, that God is going to work it for good. And so when we come to him and we say, God, I believe, would you help my unbelief? God, I believe in your will. I know what I want to happen. I know what my plan is, but I want to surrender that to your plan. Then we can begin to walk in this peace, knowing that our heavenly Father, has got it all handled, that he's going to work everything for good. Verse 33, Jesus tells us, you want to avoid worry. You want to avoid storing up possessions, trying to trust in those things instead of God. Here, here is your answer. Seek first his kingdom. Not my will, but yours be done. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know what that Greek word all means? It means all these things will be added to you. Every concern, every worry, every fear, every doubt, every struggle, your heavenly Father has it completely under control. And he is working things for your good and for his glory. And so Jesus, as he's teaching us how to live as citizens of God's kingdom, members of his household while still here on this earth, he says, so, so don't worry like, like the Gentiles do. But instead, give your life to seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness and just know that he's going to take care of all of that. He's going to handle the things that are concerning you today. In seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, you will find a life that is more abundant and more fulfilling and more satisfying than anything you could ever imagine. What your heart longs for is that loving relationship with your Father. What your heart longs for is the satisfaction of being with him and knowing that he has it all under control. You'll never have that in any other relationship, in any other circumstance, in any other thing. You only find that in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you that you are a good father. Lord, that you look down at us and our sin and our brokenness and our hopelessness. You sent Jesus into this world to suffer on our behalf. Father, we're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the resurrection and for what those things say. God, your cross sp speaks to our worth in your sight, to how much you love us. It speaks to your goodness that we can trust you. And the resurrection says that we serve a living God and that even if we suffer in this life, there's hope for eternity. So, Lord, I pray that we would be a people that stand out as light in the darkness, salt among this earth. That even though life may be difficult and even though we may suffer, we know that's coming. Father, we might suffer as men and women not burdened by worry and anxiety and fear. I pray that we might suffer even in perfect trust. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.